Hey friends, welcome back. So in today's session, we're gonna talk a little bit more about creatine with a special emphasis on the health benefits for women. I know when you think of creatine, you think of the over-muscled bodybuilder or collegiate football player, but there's a lot of good evidence to suggest that creatine can specifically help females because the intramuscular creatine levels in women is about only 10% compared to that of men. And creatine kinase levels and creatine levels really change throughout women's uh, menstrual cycle. And because estrogen influences creatine levels and creatine kinase levels, peri- and postmenopausal women stand to benefit from creatine supplementation and having more creatine in their foods because creatine is involved in energy mobilization and metabolism in the brain. It affects uh, glycine and also um, GABA synthesis and inhibitory neurotransmitters that can facilitate sleep. We know sleep challenges are a major issue for peri- and postmenopausal women. Creatine also influences athletic performance, muscular performance, and we know that as women age, and men as well, we lose our ability to retain muscle mass, and there's this whole phenomenon of sarcopenic obesity, which is loss of muscle mass paired with weight gain with age, and so creatine, as this article talks about, is an ergogenic aid that can not only help with, as I mentioned, brain health, athletic performance, muscle health, but also bone health and mood throughout lifespan. Also, as this article talks about, which was new to me, Creatine is involved in helping babies develop in the placenta because it's involved in mobilization of energy. And there's an upregulation of the enzymes that synthesize creatine in developing babies and pregnant women. So before we get carried away, let's talk about the title of the paper here, Creatine Supplementation in Women's Health, A Lifespan Perspective. Now you're probably thinking, okay, creatine, gosh, I knew this guy who was really bulky. He took creatine. So if I take creatine, I will get really bulky too. Let's just hit a quick pause. There's a lot of misconceptions around creatine. Creatine is found in your muscles. Creatine is found if you eat chicken, if you eat pork, if you eat beef, you are eating creatine. Okay, it's widely available. Creatine is involved and it's upregulated and it helps with energy, particularly ATP synthesis and resynthesis in working muscles. It's not an anabolic steroid. It's not an anabolic agent. It has misconceptions uh, and a stigma associated with it because when creatine supplements first came onto the market in the late 1990s, they were paired often with excessive amounts of dextrose and maltodextrin, okay? And of course, that can cause issues for people if you're having 20, 40, 60, 80 grams of maltodextrin or dextrose, you know, in a short period of time, because people would load with creatine, they had issues, water retention, kidney challenges, things like that. Creatine is very safe, as this article goes into and talks about, uh, and as we're gonna focus on here right now, creatine is very safe for women as well. And this is written about numerous times in this review article. Various studies have been evaluated using women as subjects. And I think this is, this is great because up to now, I've, I've received so many comments from you. Hey, you're talking about this fasting study. This fasting study was conducted in men. Why aren't you talking about studies conducted in women? Well, what's great, my friends, uh, especially ladies, is this study included a lot of women in the analysis to show that creatine is safe and effective for women. Okay. Before we get into the details, my friends, I just want to welcome you all back. It's Mike Mutzel. Thank you for tuning in to High Intensity Health. If you're enjoying this content and any of our videos, you can do a few things just to help this channel. Please hit that like button, subscribe, and also leave a comment below. It can be short and sweet. That helps the algorithm. And if you have a friend who's afraid of taking creatine or you have a friend who lifts weights and they're not really getting the benefits that they want, encourage them to watch this video so they can better understand how potentially creatine can help them. And so just a small plug, we've recently formulated and updated our electrolyte product. The electrolyte sticks features Redmond Real Salt. You're getting real salt, not that USP sodium. You're getting creatine and taurine paired with Albion chelated minerals like magnesium, getting potassium and calcium, all bundled in uh, one easy to use supplement. So if you want to support your body's creatine and, and also musculoskeletal health and exercise performance, I will put links below. Use the coupon code podcast to save on the new electrolyte sticks over at myoscience com, which is M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com, myoscience.com. So you can use that pre and post workout, but let's dive into the research so you have a better idea about, hey, what is this creatine stuff? What can it do for me? And especially as a female, what are the expected health benefits and why should I care? All right. I want to share with you this image for women right here. So this is going to be uh, figure A. 
And this is a creatine kinase activity throughout the menstrual cycle in a given month for women. So day zero to day 28. What you're seeing here is during the follicular phase, you're seeing an increase in the creatine kinase activity. And that is associated with an increase in estrogen levels that is initiating ovulation. And then eventually there's progesterone levels increasing as well. But what you're seeing here is an increase in the creatine kinase activity and more of a focus on glucose oxidation and carbohydrate oxidation. So uh, what does that really mean? Well, that means that around the menstrual cycle, because there is increased flux or churn, this could be a period of time, and the authors talk about this, where in terms of timing of creatine supplementation, it might actually benefit women the most is around ovulation during their menstrual cycle. So you might want to consider that maybe you know, you, you increase supplementation on day, you know, 12 to day, you know, 21 or something, if you're menstruating. And if you're not menstruating, the reduction in estrogen might mean that peri and postmenopausal women could actually stand to benefit from creatine supplementation because of the reduced activity of the flux in the creatine kinase activity, as these uh, researchers talk about. Uh, but I just want to clarify one thing that I mentioned earlier, uh, again, because a lot of males... Are, are regularly supplementing with creatine. If you were to break apart uh, the buyer behavior and the purchase behavior of creatine, most men are already taking creatine. But as I mentioned here, women have the most to benefit potentially from creatine supplementation because their body stores are actually already quite low. As this uh, study talks about, that females may benefit from, from creatine supplementation as a strategy or means to increase endogenous stores uh, because females have been reported to have only 10% of the resting levels of intramuscular creatine when compared to males. So think about it. Men have 90% more intramuscular creatine, and they're the ones that are they're still benefiting from taking creatine. So if you have a female, particularly, and I'm not picking on anyone, but just saying how it is, a vegan or vegetarian female, meaning they're not getting creatine, they would have the most to benefit from taking exogenous creatine in a supplement and they would most likely benefit uh, and notice those benefits when it comes to athletic performance, particularly you know, during intense exercise. And that is where creatine has the most potential benefits because it helps to rephosphorylate utilized ATP. So ATP, when you're moving your muscles, goes to ADP, adenosine triphosphate to adenosine diphosphate. Creatine helps rephosphorylate that used ATP in the form of ADP. So you put in another phosphorus group on there and that's what creatine does. Okay. So when you're doing intense exercise that have short duration, and a lot of women do this, HIIT training, high intensity interval training classes, whether it's, uh, you know, aerobic classes or group fitness classes, CrossFit, all of those sorts of explosive type movements, those athletes would benefit from taking creatine. And this article goes into some of the details, but I want to just read to you a little bit more about the hormones before we go on to the health benefits, pregnancy, mental health, and possibly sleep. So the article says, specifically, creatine supplementation may be of particular importance during menses, pregnancy, postpartum, and during and post-menopause. The menstrual cycle may influence creatine homeostasis due to cyclical nature of sex hormone regulation. Studies conducted in animal models have demonstrated that the expression of arginine glycine aminotransferase, I have no idea, by the way, what that is. Anyway, the rate-limiting step of creatine synthesis is influenced by estrogen and testosterone levels. Sex hormones, predominantly estrogen and progesterone, have been shown to affect creatine kinase uh, activities in the expression of key enzymes for the endogenous synthesis of creatine. So, the arginine glycine aminotransferase, that's a rate limiting step in the uh, final step of creatine synthesis, that is influenced by your hormones. So let's just pause all the, the biochemical jargon and talk real life, okay? Your hormones are out of whack. You've taken the birth, birth control pill. You're exposed to persistent organic pollutants in the environment. You have insulin resistance and so polycystic ovarian syndrome. There's all these phenomenon uh, that can augment or, or you know, cause changes, uh, unfavorable changes in hormones. That will ultimately then impact creatine synthesis, which could then affect and negate some of the expected benefits linked with exercise. And so that's why I think supplementation can be very helpful because you can, through you know, the law of uh, mass action and, and, and you know, priming these uh, enzymatic pathways, can help to improve uh, levels. And this is why it's beneficial. Because if you're not getting the benefits from exercise, you're unlikely to make it a habit. 
You know, that's the thing. We want people to habitually exercise. So if you're going to the gym, you're getting lackluster results, you're having a crappy workout, you're unlikely to have fun doing that endeavor, and you're not likely going to want to continue with that. So if creatine can make your workouts more fun, more enjoyable, and have a better workout so you get more adaptations and you start to notice and feel different in your body, you are going to change your food behaviors and whether or not you're going to binge drink on the weekends or stay up late, right? You, it's this, this catalyst that can foster sweeping lifestyle change and having a good workout does that. And, and that's where I want to focus in on next when it comes to creatine for both men and women, but specifically women, the potential for adverse effects from creatine supplementation are largely unfounded uh, even in women. So I think that's really important. Uh, this article talks about some of the challenges here with early creatine supplementation and uh, the fact that creatine was often paired with high levels of sugar and that we know sugar to be deleterious, especially a highly glycemic sugar like dextrose. Okay. So as I was mentioning, the aspects with regards to uh, physical activity and sports performance and why that's so important for making exercise and sport a habit. Because again, if you're not having fun when you're training or exercising, it's unlikely that you're going to continue to do that. And if you're not getting the benefits, imagine reading a book. And at the end of reading the book, you couldn't explain what you just read or to someone. You're like, oh yeah, you know what? You're talking with your friends at Friday night on dinner. I'm like, hey, what would you do this week? Oh yeah, I started this new book. What book is it? You're like, I don't know. I don't remember. I don't, I didn't learn anything you're unlikely to continue to read. You don't want to get excited about a new a new skill, a new habit. You know, you went to the gym, you're able to do 10 pull-ups now, and you can tell your friends, well, I, I started, I could barely do one. That is going to keep you after the exercise or the routine. And so we want these things to be sticky, these habits to be sticky. And I think creatine can really help there because there's a, a numerous studies, and I'm not, not going to go through all of these, but many of these studies showing that, that creatine it's effective in the context of exercise when it, when it comes to supporting muscle health, but also improving anaerobic work capacity. So what that means is that if you were to tell a group of people to do five sprints, you know, maybe a 30 second sprint followed by a two minute rest period and, and repeat, that ability to explode and to put out maximal output in an anaerobic meaning there's, you know, it's a short duration, intense exercise uh, is increased by creatine. Maximal power and force output, whether it's bench press, squat, you know, these very objective ways to assess power have all been shown in women to increase when they supplement with creatine. Now, the doses are all over the place. And I think this is important for you to figure out, you know, how much animal or red meat are you getting in your diet? If, you, if you're a vegan or vegetarian, you might want to take like more like five grams of creatine per day. And if you're getting uh, sufficient red meat and, and eggs and, and so forth in your diet, you might be better off with one to two grams of creatine per day. So it really depends on your body weight and how much dietary creatine you're getting. But I will say that in these studies, they typically have individuals load, and I know this sounds like a lot, with 20 grams of creatine for about five days, and then they do a maintenance between two and five grams of creatine per day. And at the end of these 12 to 14 week studies, when they do pre-test objective measures of strength or force output, and then post you know, intervention, like 12 to 14 weeks later, they retest subjects, there's generally between a you know, 12 to 25% boost in anaerobic work capacity, uh, strength, and then also like force and, and explosiveness related biomarkers uh, or proxies of strength. So again, most of these are in younger collegiate athletes, but some of these studies, and we'd be here all day if I read them all to you, are also in postmenopausal women. So this is not specific to just young, you know, menstruating women or, or collegiate athletes. This is linked with improvements in um, physical activity in both uh, older women as well. Okay. So one particular quote here that I, that I wanted to share with you uh, is anaerobic work, capa work capacity. So that is the ability uh, to explode, uh, doing short duration, high intensity sprint work. Uh, if you think about the, uh, a skier, a rower, uh, things like that. After just five days of creatine supplementation, there was a 22% increase in anaerobic working capacity. So um, again, if you're going to do sprints on a skier, or sprints outside, um, you will definitely uh, notice an improvement. And again, that improvement will make exercise more sticky. That's the whole point. 
a lot of you in your 60s are not trying to, to go to the Olympics, right? You're just trying to live a more functional life. And if you can make exercise more fun, if you can say, hey, I'm actually good at this and I'm getting better, that progress, if we're not getting progress and if we're not having fun during exercise or when we're reading or whenever, we're unlikely to make that habit sticky. So I just want to make that uh, very clear. Okay. And now let's finish off here with cognition and pregnancy. Again, these were things prior to reading this paper. That's free. And again, I'll link the references in the show notes. I had no idea that creatine was involved in, in promoting a healthy pregnancy or improving cognition and brain health and mental health in women. I think this is really important. Uh, so I just want to read uh, to you here. So the, the title here, this is section four, creatine considerations during pregnancy. To date, there is growing evidence in animal models that creatine supplementation during pregnancy enhances, augments neuronal cell uptake of creatine and supports mitochondrial integrity in animal offspring, thereby reducing brain injury uh, induced via interpartum asphyxia. So these are ways where you know, unfortunately, animals, uh, baby animals are asphyxiated to show that these things are helpful. Um, however, although there are no human studies, of course, because that would be unethical to do that uh, to humans, uh, to date, that have evaluated the effects of creatine supplementation during pregnancy. Uh, the authors say that creatine supplementation could provide a safe, low-cost nutritional strategy to reduce intra- and postpartum complications associated with cellular energy depletion. And that is, my friends is where I think creatine, the mechanisms as to how it could be effective for women, especially peri- and postmenopausal women, is cellular energy production, not only in the placenta, you know, during pregnancy, but also in the brain throughout menopause. Because what I hear commonly, uh, my mom's friends and, and my friends that are uh, postmenopausal, is they do start to notice changes with, with verbal acuity, uh, with working memory. And so, you know, part of that is literally energy changes of how estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone uh, change the energy homeostasis within the brain. And it turns out that creatine might help with that. So I think that's a, another thing to focus on. So just one more paragraph here, and then we're going to dive into the brain. Creatine supplementation has been shown to uh, act as a possible countermeasure to menopausal-related decreases in muscle, bone, and strength by reducing inflammation, oxidative stress, and serum markers of bone resorption, while also resulting in an, uh, a concomitant increase in osteoblast activity. So I think that's important because the osteoblasts, in contrast to the osteoclasts, are involved in bone formation. Okay, so as you age, you lose muscle, you gain fat, and you lose bone. Again, oh, there's all sorts of things that you can do to improve uh, reverse course, uh, those aforementioned mechanisms. Creatine helps with all of those. So if you have a better workout, you're putting more force on the muscle, you're going to preserve muscle and prevent muscle loss, and the tension on the muscle supports bone health. So that is also important. But muscle integrity is important because you do not want to fall and break your hip or break a bone. Uh, and, and also, uh, loss of muscle mass with age is linked with insulin resistance and reduce insulin sensitivity, all of which, by the way, is increased and supported by creatine. Okay. Now, let's get into depression and mood and finish off there. I think it's this to me is just fascinating because uh, particularly here, you know, we're recording today in Seattle. Uh, and there was a recent article about the antidepressant use in the, the state of Washington and Seattle specifically, and it's one of the most medicated areas for uh, mental health in the entire country. So, you know, major cities, whether it's Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore, you know, Los Angeles, San Francisco, all these cities, uh, now, you know, somehow they were able to aggregate prescriptions specifically for mental health. One of the most depressed regions of the country. Uh, and so, you know, we do focus on things here like vitamin D and sunlight. And a lot of people have these different aspects. But if you were to survey 100 people on the street and say, do you take creatine for your depression? They'd probably say, no, I'm not a bodybuilder. Why would I take creatine? Well, that's where I want to focus on because it turns out that depression rates are two times higher amongst females compared to males. So a lot of people don't know that. So women are much harder on themselves uh, and, and as potentially in, in the hormone changes and the whole thing. And it turns out that the increased prevalence of depression rates amongst females has been directly linked with the hormonal milestones, like I mentioned, menopause and, and so forth. Um, also, during puberty, depression rates are higher. And as I mentioned, that estrogen increases the flux of creatine. Uh, so, you know, teenage women, especially if they're athletic, could benefit from creatine, as this article goes into. Uh, talk about 
But early research shows that there is a role for dysfunctional creatine metabolism in the neuronal chemical foundations of depression in adults, demonstrating a positive relationship between cerebral spinal fluid levels of creatine and dopamine and serotonin metabolites. Okay, so uh, there are several interventional studies that the authors go in to talk about uh, the preclinical and clinical you know, sort of observations with creatine as an intervention to help with mental health. Uh, because as I just mentioned, it's involved in the synthesis of the neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine that influence how we feel, mood, affect, and mental health. So I wanna continue on here and finish up with why this is so important and even get into sleep. I think this is really under-recognized. But let's talk about the response rate when it comes to and the associations with creatine insufficiency and depression. Really important because um, a lot of people are suffering from depression and people that are depressed are more likely to overconsume and self-medicate with alcohol, with junk food, with porn, gambling, the whole thing. So if we can help people feel better, they're more likely, again, to stick to healthy living and eating better foods and exercise as outlets to improve their mood as opposed to the maladaptive self-medication of things that have deleterious long-term consequences. Interesting point that I want you to know about. Dietary creatine intake is inversely proportional with depression occurrence, with a 31% greater incidence of depression in adults with the lowest quartile of creatine intake. And so there's various authors and researchers in Australia and all throughout the world that have been talking about this. I know it's controversial, but talking about how red meat in particular, because it contains a lot of taurine, a lot of carnitine, a lot of creatine, uh, carnosine, it can be helpful. And if you think about it, who is more likely to reduce their meat consumption, uh, especially as they sort of start to become healthier over time? And it's generally women. A lot more women are, are advocates with regards to animal-free diets and going plant-based and, and things like that. So they would certainly benefit if there's a mental health issue uh, and also uh, a sports performance decline uh, with going on those diets, supplementing with creatine. So as we continue on here, they say increasing creatine concentration in the brain is a result of increased animal product protein uh, consumption and more effectively through creatine supplementation. Okay, and this has strong evidence to support mood and depression, particularly in females, as I just mentioned. So let's finish off with creatine and sleep. And I think this is important, especially if you're in a situation where you're not getting sufficient sleep. If you're a shift worker or you're under high stress and you're only getting six or five hours of sleep or something like that, uh, the authors speculate and talk about due to preclinical studies, how creatine could be helpful in those particular situations because of the fact that brain metabolism to support the various stages of sleep and the various wavelengths uh, within the brain associated with sleep, that creatine could be helpful. So they say that creatine supplementation has also been shown to support greater neuronal ATP resynthesis, which provides a cognitive advantage for tasks that rely upon the frontal cortex. This is involved in memory, attention, and cognition. And brain creatine concentrations appear to be variable based upon age uh, and lifestyle choices, diet, and other factors. And so um, they, they talk about, uh, particularly when it comes to sleep and cognition, that creatine has been shown to be really helpful and that sleep deprivation uh, can deplete neuronal creatine levels. So again, if you're suffering from sleep loss associated with age, particularly as a female, you might benefit from supporting, uh, supplementing with creatine you know, one to maybe five grams a day, depending upon uh, where you're at. Okay, so as we finish off here, let's talk about the conclusions and when you might want to dose and take creatine and how much based upon your activity level. So as the studies often find, you know, various clinical studies find that a loading phase could be more helpful. So you can do a loading phase of 10 to 20 grams for about five days and then do a maintenance phase of say two to five grams per day. Now that depends upon the individual, whether you like it or not. Uh, we have a lot of red meat in our household. Um, we buy half a cow every so often. I have friends who go out and hunt wild game and we're given animal meat and so forth. So we have plenty of creatine in our diet. What I personally do is I just take two, two to three grams per day and I take it around exercise. I take a little bit beforehand and of course, I'm biased because we have a supplement business and I take it in the form of the Albion uh, magnesium creatine combination. Um, and I take that, you know, before and after exercise and sometimes during. Look, I find that this really helps with sports performance, with exercise. You know, if sometimes if we're doing uh, lactate threshold type work, uh, if we're doing maximal uh, power output, I notice a significant benefit. Um, so that's just how I do it. Uh, it's not stimulatory. You 
if you take creatine in the evening, if you work out in the evening, don't think that it's going to keep you wide awake. It's not like caffeine, okay? This is, this is helpful for people who resist and strain. So take it around exercise. And if you forget, right, it's still gonna benefit you by taking it at another time, but try to remember to take it either before, during, or after exercise. That's what some of the studies show. And if you notice that you're, you've taken creatine and you didn't really get the benefit, you may want to do a higher dose loading phase. Uh, creatine monohydrate, you don't need the dextrose. You can do, you know, like seven grams three times a day. And that will get you to that 20 gram loading phase. You don't need to do this perpetuity. This can be, like I said, uh, for several days, four or five days, and then you back down to the two, two to a five gram maintenance phase on the creatine. So that's why I think, I think it's highly underutilized. There's a lot of health benefits, not just associated with exercise, but also mental health, as we talked about, sleep potentially, uh, the hormone changes associated with age, and making exercise a habit. So what do you think when it comes to creatine? I would love to know your thoughts. Let me know in the comments below. As always, friends, if you're still here and you're enjoying it, hit that like button. Thanks for sharing this video. Thanks for subscribing. And I will link some of the articles that uh, we talked about today and they're associated images so that you can do your own research. I encourage you to read and dive into this uh, at your leisure. So we'll catch you on a future video down the road. Bye now.